You're on the air with AM 800 WRTH, broadcasting out. Thank you for tuning in for another personal story. When I'm not holding down the station here at WRTH, I'm a librarian. And I've been in libraries for over two decades. I love libraries. And I love librarians. A good librarian has a passion about them. Several passions. They're thrilled by knowledge. They're enticed by fiction. And they're happiest when they're sharing new books, media, and information with others. I fell for this passion over 20 years ago, and I still feel it in my soul today. And sometimes, librarians are so passionate, they never seem to leave the job, even after they leave this world. I kind of literally grew up in a library. When I was about three, my dad got a job with the library system in Yakima, Washington. He was brought on as a facilities maintenance guy, which meant that he kept the library and various branches clean and fixed things that needed to be fixed. My dad has a good hand for carpentry, electrical work, welding, fabrication, metalwork, plumbing, and more. To this day, he's a jack of many trades, and he's pretty damn good at all of them. So I was just a kid when he started working at what was at the time called the Yakima Valley Regional Library, or YVRL. The main library was closed on Sundays at the time, and that's when he'd go down to do the kind of work that's best done when there's no one in the library, especially the public. The main library has high ceilings along with a mezzanine, and within those high ceilings are the fluorescent lights that brightened up the days and the evenings of library patrons. He needed to change those tubes occasionally or replace ballast, which meant standing on a scissor lift, a good 40 to 50 feet above the floor. As I got older, maybe five or six, he'd take me with him to the library so I could hang out, read, and just run around the stacks and play, so long as I didn't make a mess, of course. The most important thing I was there to do was call 911 if something happened. Thankfully, nothing ever did. Dad's pretty careful when it comes to standing up that high and fiddling with wires thing is, there was another reason he brought me down there, and I didn't realize it until much later. Dad started his day around 5 in the morning. He had to be at the main library early to get things cleaned up, prep his vehicle for the day because he often traveled to different branches, and generally make sure the place was ready to open. Because of that, he was often in the building a good two or three hours before anyone else ever showed up for work but that doesn't mean he was alone. The main library has four floors. The main floor, above that a mezzanine, the basement, and just a little below the basement is the library's large meeting room or auditorium. I consider that to be a lower level because, while it's not far below the basement, you still have to walk down a flight of stairs to get there. The maintenance office is in the basement, tucked away next to the break room and the staff restrooms. Just outside of the office are the archives and storage collections for the library. YVRL Maine housed a large collection of periodicals, along with stacks and stacks of books, that they kept in the basement because, while they didn't check out regularly, they didn't want to just dump them either. In other words, the basement was a completely different library and one that the public rarely saw at the time. While the newer books and media remained upstairs, the storage stacks were there when a patron needed an older item. They'd simply request it, and we'd go get it. It was a library of its own, filled with older books. And I'll come back to that in a bit, because I think the secondary library, full of older materials, is a larger part of this story. One night, the family gathered around the table, my mom and dad and me. I don't remember how old I was, but I'm pretty sure I was still in elementary school. We were talking about ghosts because the subject just came up somehow. 
and Dad casually mentioned that he thought the library was haunted. For a young boy harboring an interest in the supernatural, that comment immediately grabbed my attention and I started pressing my dad for details. He wasn't scared by the ghost. Indeed, at that point, he wasn't sure what was going on, but he was pretty sure something was there because things kept happening. At first, it was little things. He'd be on one side of the building at 6.30 in the morning. He knows for a fact he's the only one there, and yet he clearly hears a door slam on the other side of the building. YVRL Main is a big, box-like structure with a lot of empty space. In a quiet, empty library, you can literally hear people coughing from one side of the building to another, even if you're on different floors. he jump, of course, because it's a sudden loud noise in a place that doesn't belong, even when the library is open. The first few times it happened, he'd grab something to use as a weapon and go check it out. He'd never find anything. And what was he looking for anyway? Most of the doors were closed in the early morning anyway, and he didn't make any notes about which ones were open. So he'd go back to work. That was that. The door slamming was a regular thing, so much so that he just got used to it after a while. Sometimes a door nearby would slam, sometimes right down the hall. He'd check, find nothing, shrug, and go back to work. Until that one time, in the early morning hours, when he was working on something in the basement, and someone called his name. Well, that certainly got his attention. I think, I think we've all had something similar like this. We're alone in a quiet place. Nothing but our thoughts to keep us company. And we'll hear our name. It's an audio hallucination, of course. It's, it's not uncommon. I've heard my name several times in my own house, and I don't believe it to be haunted. But that's something peculiar to my father and I. When this little trick appears in our brains, it's always a male voice. My hypothesis is that it's always a male voice because in reality, it's your own voice. No one is calling our name, but we heard it. And it was a male voice because the voice came from inside of our minds. So Dad's used to that. He's heard his name called before and paid it no mind. It was the same voice he'd hear calling his name at home just before falling asleep. But this time, it was a woman's voice. And it was just as clear as if she was standing down the hallway. He turned and responded. And nothing came back. He checked and found no one. But it happened again, and again after that. The slamming doors, the voice in the distance, and always the same voice. When it was a woman calling his name, it was always the same voice. I'd ask him about this stuff occasionally, and he'd fill me in. At some point, he gave the ghost a name. Because by this time, he'd heard the voice and found no explanation for the slamming doors. He figured it was something, and a ghost was just as good an explanation as anything else. Because he's a fan of classic movies, he called her Mrs. Muir after the 1947 film starring Gene Tierney and Rex Harrison. He talked to her. Because, why not? And the weirdest thing is, she'd respond in her own way. Not through her voice, but through her actions. If he was working on something and had to be cautious, like fixing an electrical problem, He'd politely call out and ask if she'd not slam any doors for a few minutes because he didn't want to get hurt. And she didn't. She wouldn't. The place was quiet as, well, as quiet as a library. And he'd finish his job without any surprises. When she did slam a door and startle him, he'd gently admonish her for it and then tell her good morning. When he heard his name, he'd say hello. It seemed like the thing to do, you know? My dad worked there for 16 years before I started working at the library. He told the circulation supervisor that I needed a job, something steadier than my work at the theater because, while the theater paid well, it only paid when there was a show. And there wasn't always a show. 
I put in an application for a page position, and they hired me a couple of weeks later. As a page, it was my job to shelve materials, keep the stacks tidy, and retrieve things from the basement. It was a treat to work in the same place as my father, so we'd often eat lunch together and take our breaks at the same time, adjusting our schedules as needed. Occasionally, I'd need to head downstairs to the storage stacks and shelve down there. Not only were the older materials downstairs, there were the bound periodicals. After people were done using these things, pages went and put them away. Sometimes I'd have a full cart of stuff and I'd just head down the elevator and spend some time in the basement. I liked it because it was cool and quiet, and it was relaxing to shelve down there. One particularly slow evening, I had a few stacks of some bound magazines to go back down on the shelves, along with a handful of older books to return to storage. At the time, the library didn't close until 9 in the evening, but most of the staff working in the basement left by 5 o'clock. By 6, all the staff would have cleared out, and the basement was a hushed, dimly lit area. You could turn the lights on, but you needed to turn them off when you left, and most of the time I could see just fine, so I didn't bother. I wheeled my book cart into the elevator and down to the basement. The periodicals were easy to shelf, so I did those first. I left my cart there and picked up the few items to go back into the storage and walked back into the darker areas. I put a couple of items away and had my back to the main aisle while I looked at one of the items to figure out what it was and where it went. And behind me, a woman walked down that main aisle, her high heels making a distinctive clicking on the tile floor as she wandered off in the direction of the elevator and the staircase. Now, it's a library. I worked with a lot of women. The sound of high heels on tile floor was an everyday kind of thing. I stuck my head around the corner to let her know I was there, and with the lights off, it'd be easy to startle someone who missed me standing in the stacks. There was no one there. She wasn't running. She was walking. She'd have still been in the aisle. And she was not there. My mind immediately went to the ghost, but I also recognized that of course it would. I, I wasn't paying any attention. I was looking at a book. And I think I heard something. I think I heard a ghost in the dimly lit basement of a library that my dad told me was haunted. Of course I did. And I put it aside. After all... Dad told me about the voices, the slamming doors, the occasional thing that would get moved. I didn't even mention it to him that evening because I was afraid I'd sound like a schoolboy who was so awfully excited to hear the ghost too. I wanted something less subtle. And a couple of months later, I got it. I worked the evening shift regularly, and I got to the point where I'd hear the high heels maybe once a week, always at night, and there was never anyone there. It occurred to me that, if this sound were heard during the day, no one would pay any mind to it. Like I said, a fair bit of the basement was tiled. The sound of high heels walking around would be a daily thing. But I knew something was weird when I started hearing them walk by me, and I was facing the main aisle. I started keeping it in sight whenever I was in the stacks, and I was always curious, you know, that my imagination just loved a ghost story and maybe it was just making one up for me. Until the incident outside the auditorium. As I said, the large meeting room and auditorium was a level down from the basement. We didn't always have a lot going on in there, but here and there a group would use it for something. One night, as we were getting ready to close up, I was downstairs, outside the auditorium, making sure the lights were off and the doors were locked. While the auditorium was dark, the hallway outside was well lit. I made sure the lights inside the auditorium were off and locked both doors. Behind me, I heard those footsteps again, high heels on tile, walking down the hall and then up the stairs before fading out. The hair on my neck went straight up, because that... It wasn't scary, but it was off. It was wrong, because that's not what I should have heard. The next morning, I grabbed my dad, because I had two questions for him. 
You've told me about the ghosts, the voices, the slamming doors, all of that stuff, right? Sure, he replied over his cup of coffee. He had a gleam in his eyes that wouldn't make sense until about three minutes later. Did you leave out anything? I pressed. Like what? he asked. Have you ever heard footsteps? You never mentioned footsteps. He put his coffee down and looked right at me before responding. He said I could write off the slamming doors and the voices and the noises, just noises in an empty building. I could ignore the voices calling my name as my own imagination. The footsteps, the sound of a woman walking around the place, I can't explain that. I never brought it up because I wanted someone else to tell me that they heard it too. How do you know it's a woman, I said. Because of the high heels, he replied, sipping his coffee. Okay, so we both heard this. I've heard her walking around the stacks downstairs, and you have too, right? He nodded. So, second question. The hallway outside of the auditorium. Was that always carpeted? His eyes lit up, and he sat straight upright in his chair. No, it used to be tiled. You heard it too, he asked. Last night, locking up the auditorium, I heard a woman walking around behind me, her high-heeled shoes clicking on that tiled floor. I've heard that several times now in storage, but that's a tiled floor. The hallway outside the auditorium? That's carpet. So... Did she go upstairs, or was she coming down? Going upstairs, I said. I didn't hear anyone coming down. Dad nodded again. Yeah, she's always going upstairs. A few days later, after thinking about it for a while, it dawned on me. Of course she's going upstairs. First, there's nothing much down where the auditorium is. There are two stairways on either side of a hall. She's going upstairs because that's where the books are. Later that year, I was in the library on my own, clearing a book drop on a Sunday evening because it was a three-day weekend and we'd need the space for people returning things all day Monday while we were closed. After emptying everything in the bin behind the circulation desk and returning it to the drop, I had another quick look around before gathering my stuff to leave. Danny. She was going down to the children's section, I think. That's what it sounded like. She wasn't right there with me. But we were on the same floor. I knew that. I didn't jump. I don't think I was even startled. I heard my name and I walked over to the end of the desk and headed down to the children's section. I thought about it for a second and responded. Good morning, and how are you today, ma'am? I said. As I reached the children's library, I looked around. and there was, there was no one there. Oddly, this voice calling my name added another layer to this gathering pile of paranormal occurrences. To my friends, I'm Dan. To many of the people I work with, I'm Dan or Daniel. To my dad, and to the lady who was my circulation manager, my boss, who'd known me since I was a kid, I was Danny. When I was playing in the stacks while my dad worked, I was Danny, that's what he called me. There were three people in that library who called me Danny. My dad, my boss, and that voice. I heard her voice several times, always my name always trying to get my attention, to pull me over someplace. And it was always Danny. But you see, I'd been talking to her too, but she never responded. Hell, I don't even know if she was around at the time I talked to her. But I'd let her know I was in the basement, tell her good evening, ask her about her day, tell her about mine, and be on my way. If anyone ever heard me, they'd think I was insane. And maybe I am. But if ever I was there alone, I'd tell her what I was doing just to see if I could get any response. One day, I asked her about something good to read. I loved those old books in the basement and would regularly check those out, right, just looking for something different. The old travel books really snagged me, and I was looking for one about going to Hawaii or Polynesia or something like that. It's incredibly interesting to read about a time where traveling to Polynesia isn't as easy as boarding a 747 and maybe a puddle jumper. I told her so, and I asked for a recommendation. After all, by this point, 
I figured she's obviously the spirit of a librarian. Nothing happened, certainly. So I grabbed a book on traveling to the islands and went back upstairs. Later that evening, I was back in the same area putting stuff away. I turned and walked down the aisle where I'd found the book on Polynesia. And there on the floor, face down, is a book. Keep in mind, these stacks aren't really touched all that much, and only by staff. We get things off the shelves, and we put the things back on the shelves, and that's it. I'd never seen a book on the floor there in the stacks. I didn't even remember asking the spirit for a recommendation earlier, until I picked it up and started to put it away. There was an obvious hole on the shelf where it had, where it had been. I checked the call number, checked the shelf, and checked the title. The Happy Lagoons, Adventures of a South Sea Wanderer by Jorgen Anderson Rosendahl. And that's when I remembered asking for a recommendation. I looked around. I didn't see anything, of course. But I said thank you. I checked the book out and took it home. And to this day, this 1961 book about a former Danish diplomat gallivanting all around Tahiti, Samoa, and Tonga isn't just one of my favorite books about traveling in Polynesia, it's one of my favorite travel books, period. I guess she knew what she was talking about. Years later, something occurred to me when I thought about this incident again. Most of the time, whenever I felt her presence and heard her, it was downstairs in the basement. That time I heard her call my name upstairs, that was one of the rare times I ever heard her on the main floor. I'd hear her and feel her all over the library, but the majority of the time, it was somewhere around the periodicals and storage stacks in the basement. That's when I realized, of course that's where she'd like to hang out. Those books, they're old, and they're in storage. But they used to be part of the primary collection. These were books that used to be upstairs. And if my general idea of when she worked at the library was right, these were the books that she worked with. This was her collection. Absolutely, absolutely she knew which was the best book on traveling to Polynesia. Before I sign off, I want to share two more things, because, after all, I told you about the experiences my dad and I had at the library with a library ghost. For all you know, we're both a bit off, and we've got overly active imaginations. After years of service at the library, my dad was eventually promoted to facilities maintenance coordinator and given an assistant to supervise. One of these assistants, we'll call him Carl. Carl was Hispanic and spoke fluent Mexican Spanish. As with my dad, it wasn't unusual for him to be alone in the library in the mornings. After all, he was doing the stuff that my dad used to do. One day, he found my father in the maintenance office and sat down. Bob, he said, have you ever had anything strange happen to you in the mornings? My dad slowly turned in his chair. He talked to me about this stuff. He would never brought it up with Carl. Go on, my dad said. I was down in the auditorium area this morning, Carl replied, worry etched upon his face, and someone called my name. Oh, my dad said. You have to understand something. This was, for the first time in years, fully independent verification of something he and I knew about for ages. But Carl wasn't done yet. But it's weird, Bob, Carl went on. It wasn't so much that someone called my name. It's that everyone around here calls me Carl, except the lady who called me over by the auditorium. She called me by my Spanish name. Whoever did that. She called me Carlos. Finally, there was a guy in IT. He was a nice enough guy, but he was fairly no-nonsense. He approached his job as something to be done, and he'd do it, professionally. At the time, the library was making some changes in the computer lab, a room stocked with computers thanks to a grant from the Gates Foundation. He was in there, upgrading systems, running some cables, that kind of thing. 
and he'd been at it for some time when, suddenly, he storms back into the IT work area and sits down at his desk. The head of IT asks him if he'd finished the stuff he was working on, and he said something along the lines of, no, not yet. He'd asked for some help, and the IT supervisor could tell that something wasn't right. This no-nonsense guy, who never mentioned anything about anything outside of professional work stuff, told his supervisor that he absolutely refused to go back in that computer lab alone. Someone would have to be with him. He wouldn't say why, and it was obvious that he was a little embarrassed. But he was also absolutely serious. So, they got the things done, much more quickly since there were two people working on it. And while he worked there, he never strayed from that demand. He'd never go back into the computer lab on his own. And he never said why. Fascinating, actually. Because the computer lab? It was located downstairs, in a room just off to the side of the auditorium. Thank you for listening, and good night. <laughs>